Welcome back everybody. So in this lecture we're going to be talking about queer theory and exploring some of the key sort of uh, tenements around queer theory. This is meant to be an introduction so a lot of the things that I'm going to be touching upon we will actually be exploring further in depth uh, as the weeks go by. But this is just sort of to get you familiar, to get you a little bit acquainted, especially for those of you uh, where queer theory, this is very new for you and so forth. So how I'm going about queer theory is to look at it from three different uh, angles. Because it kind of, when you say queer, it can mean three different things. One being an identity, the other a theory, queer theory, and then an action to queer or queering. So queer as an identity. Queer as a term in the English language um, as well there's equivalence ones in other languages um, is pretty well known especially by older generations um, as a derogatory term towards mostly men who are either having sexual relationships with other men but not even necessarily that just men that other individuals both men and women consider to be not manly or too feminine it was used as a derogatory term and it still is used today to a certain extent queer as a term in, in regards to the english language has been around since the um renaissance era but as but being used um, as a derogatory term came about you know around a hundred or so years ago. I said that you know that it, it was used as a derogatory term and it still is to a certain extent. Um, but a lot of individuals have reclaimed that term, um, just like many uh, similar experiences with other uh, my uh, you know marginalized groups who have who have had horrific, you know, terrible ethnic, racial, sexist, uh, homophobic slurs being thrown onto them have sort of reclaimed it as their own, as a way of resistance. Queer is one of those examples um, in regards to the LGBTQ community in which queer has been uh, reclaimed um, as an identity, as something that's actually positive rather than negative. And, you know, queer will mean different to different people, um, but oftentimes it's associated with individuals, particularly when they're talking about, like, I am queer. Uh, oftentimes it's referred to a sexual orientation, though it has been referred to for some people as also their gendered identity. But um, generally when somebody says, like, I'm queer, instead of, you know, I'm gay or I'm a lesbian or I'm bisexual, or pansexual, or so forth. There's many other <laughs> sexuals than just those. Um, that it, it often um, is uh, responding to a person's feelings, desires, thoughts, and not only about themselves, their own sexual identity, uh, as well as gender identity, but also to other individuals in which they don't feel necessarily that identity label identity labels like gay or straight really fits them and uh, many people who identify with the term queer oftentimes want to challenge those sort of st stringent you know binary identities you're either straight or you're gay and also to reflect you know their own personal desires like maybe they like people or have romantic relationships or sexual relationships and they don't necessarily have to be you know, they don't, don't necessarily have to happen at the same time for individuals where they, you know, are romantically attracted to persons of a certain gender gender, or are pe people who express more masculinity than femininity. All of this is just to say that um, queer as a sort of an identity category is something that is very much referencing fluidity in regards to sexual orientation and, and even gender identity and also a resistance to some labels. Um, on a personal note, I identify as queer, um, and I sort of started identifying as queer back in my 20s, a million years ago, uh, but back in my 20s, and it just sort of, it was finally the word that really sort of described me in the sense of somebody who is 
romantically, sexually attracted to people across the gender spectrum and didn't necessarily felt that I didn't didn't feel that like the category bisexual really sort of fit me um, but so that was a personal choice so that's just an example of how queer is an identity that's very fluctuating and um, can mean many different things sometimes queer is also just used as a general sort of term as just for people who are not heterosexual necessarily um, but as a personal identity category, it can mean a lot of things. So it's really important that if you do meet somebody who identifies as queer, just ask them what they mean by it and, and don't make assumptions. Okay, so now moving on from queer as an identity, let's talk about queer as a theory, which is the whole point of this class. So uh, queer theory is an umbrella term to represent a large array of literatures, both sort of theoretical uh, scholarship, but also art pieces as well as um, creative writing, as well as sociological, anthropological research, which is where my field is. It is a wide and diverse field, so to sort of, just to put that forward, that as we go and we talk about the key tenements for this lecture, know that these are very general, and that there's a lot more diversity and variety in the field of queer studies and queer theory that we can sort of go into for this class. But queer theory as a term was, has been credited to Teresa de Loretes, uh, and where she used the term um, in her book Differences, which really does explore sexuality and gender and is a core text within queer theory as sort of a building block where she was describing already the conversations going around uh, gender and sexuality and society and so forth. So to go into talking about some key sort of features around key, uh, queer theory, I want to first talk about the recognition of the role of social interpretation in understanding all aspects of human life. So what that means is that queer theory argues that any sort of social event, our ideas, our relationships, our practices, like how we dress, how we are, what we think about, are never sort of just like naturally occurring or self-evident but always require some sort of social interpretation or a social key to decode and make sense of them. So things that we take for granted that we don't even notice, right, that we think are normal or natural or usual um, aren't always so. So a great thing that a uh, great example is gender, which we are going to be talking a lot about in the, as the semester goes forward. And feminists have contributed a lot of important scholarship towards. Um, but, you know, gender is something that we often take for granted, that we just assume that it's just how it is, how it's always been, you know, the way that we think of femininity versus masculinity, the way that we think how a woman should behave or how a man should behave, the way that we even think about how we should dress regard uh, uh, based on our gender identity to even what we are capable of uh, in regards to, like, future career or whatever we take for granted and we see it as something that is normal or natural and not realizing that much of it has is dependent upon uh, how we're taught socially about how we to think about these issues so a great example and again we're going to talk a lot more about this in the second week but a great example is a nipple a nipple is a piece of flesh right Men have nipples, women have nipples, people who are across the gender spectrum have nipples. And for the most part, you know, nipples are the same. Like, they, <laughs> there's no really uh, big, huge biological differences between a male nipple and a female nipple, right? It's just a nipple. But yet, as a society, we treat these pieces of flesh as something very different. So, uh, you know, if you watch, like, and I'm talking about mainstream television, like CBS, NBC, 
or if you look at magazine ads, or um, even just walking around on a hot sunny day, a man shirtless is not seen as being indecent. Um, he will not be arrested for indecent exposure. But a woman who shows the same piece of flesh could be arrested, could be detained, and oftentimes um, her nipple is blurred, particularly in media, in regards to mainstream media, like, you know, news, uh, as well as, in, you know, popular advertisements and popular television shows, not counting Game of Thrones, but... <laughs> And yet, you know, so here we have two drastically different sort of regulations on a piece of flesh that is pretty much the same. Like, there's really no difference. But the minute that we put a gender component to it, we have a completely different sort of idea of not only what this piece of flesh symbolizes and represents, but how we should regulate it. So we're going to talk obviously a lot more about this as the semester goes forward, but this example, just the nipple example, is is a way to sort of talk about how queer theory is very much committed to challenging that which is perceived as normal. Something that we take as for granted, like, oh, yeah, a man can show his nipples, that's not a big deal, they're fine, but a woman should not, right? So a core sort of part of queer theory is, a, you know, first recognition that Anything that we pretty much think about or, or act or even regulate has a social component to it, has, gone, has our own sort of social lens on it. But then also to sort of critique, well, why do we treat this? Why do we treat a piece of flesh, like a nipple, so differently based on gender? Another aspect to queer theory is around the history of sexuality. So sexual uh, identities as well as gender itself are historically contingent, socially constructed categories which can and have been assembled differently at different times. So what this means is that same-sex desires, intimacy, sexual practices, relationships have always been present. You know, there's, they, they're, they've not only been historically always been present, but, you know, across cultures and so forth. But to, especially when we talk about history, to describe, like, the same-sex sexual activities of the ancient Greece, which was pretty abundant, or even in the Middle Ages and so forth, to say like those individuals who are engaging in same-sex sexual activities um, as being gay or being lesbian or even queer would not be accurate because, first of all, those identity labels did not exist back then. You know, who you had sex with was not considered an identity. It was, um, you know, just you had sex. Um, and it didn't really happen, it wasn't until the 20th century where that changed. Um, and a person who writes a lot about it, uh, this is historian, queer historian and critical writer is David Halperin, and he wrote a really, uh, fundamental essay in queer theory called How to Do the History of Male Homosexuality, where he talks about this, like, can we go back and say that this person was gay when in reality he would have not considered himself gay? even though he is engaging in same-sex sexual activities. And, you know, we're going to explore this a lot more in week two as well, about the, the modern sexual identities. Heterosexuality, right? Is an, but as well as homosexuality, gay, lesbian, etc., um, are relatively new uh, identity categories that came out of medicine, as well as sort of the shifting social dynamics brought on by the birth of cities and industrialization. So I'm going to explore this and give you a lot more history um, next week about this, but this is sort of give you the fact that even identities that we have, like gender identities, sexual identities, have, a, have constantly changed through time and obviously have also changed through different cultures and so forth. A next sort of key uh, fundamental uh, theory or sort of component to queer theory is around building upon the fact that, that 
gender identities, sexual identities are socially, historically contingent, socially constructed, and so forth, is the idea that just in general, gender, biological sex, and sexuality are socially constructed. So this is very much... Um, uh, feminists have written about that, but uh, what queer theory has done is to not only build upon this, and I'll talk about this in the next lecture about what feminism has done around gender, but, but also to say that it's not only that they are socially constructed, but also rejects this idea that there are two hard binaries, you know, between male, female, gay, straight, uh, homosexual, heterosexual. Um, one, you know, here typically in the U.S. we live... Uh, by a gender binary. We have two genders, male and female. At least, you know, that's what is properly popularly conceptualized. Of course, that is not the case, and many individuals um, identify with neither of these categories, and many communities such as Native Americans have more than two genders, and many communities actually outside of the West have more than two genders. Um, but here in the U.S., we have enforced a gender binary in a multiple of ways, which we'll, we'll, which we will explore. But one of the things that queer theory, particularly queer scientists, have done is to reject the scientific basis to gender and biological sex. And the truth is, is that you know, there is sort of the the idea of how gender is biological or even just the sex is biological um, has been challenged by queer theorists and scientists by first saying that you know when we look at sort of biology itself there's no foolproof scientific test for gender there are no hormonal chromosomal or anatomical tests that can be administered which in every case guarantees that this person being tested is either male or female. There is such a wide variation in regards to hormones, chromosomes, and just anatomy that there's nobody who's ever been born who's like 100% female and then 100% male. Like that sort of idea of like a strict binary between the two does not exist. So therefore then, you know, if gender does not equate or reduce to chromosomes, genes, genitals, or hormones, therefore then gender is a social construction. It is produced by a wide variety of social interactions as well as uh, the way that we are not only you know interacting with each other differently because of our perceived genders, but also how we've been regulated by aspects of state like medicine as well as education and so forth. So fundamentally, you know, queer theory, particularly queer scientists, um, argue that gender as well as biological sex is not a biological certainty. Nobody's born 100% male or 100% female. And instead, Gender is established through a wide variety of social interactions, institutions, in which that teaches young children to identify themselves and behave as either a boy or a girl. And then that just sort of follows them through through adulthood. Lastly, a big sort of core tenement around queer theory is around interrogating power and its impact in regulating individuals who do not fit so nicely or so neatly into norms. Uh, you know, we can talk about gender, which we will be exploring uh, in week uh, four around this. But power is, a, you, know, in, you know, interrogating power and how it controls and regulates individuals it's a key tenement to queer theory. And in and power is both institutional power, like medicine, how the field of medicine has regulated bodies, particularly trans bodies, but we can also talk about um, sexual minorities, right? Uh, as well as structural power. How is the state, how is legal institutions um, regulated individuals. I work in the field of immigration and very much immigration law and who we let into this country and who we don't fall along fall upon very racial, gendered, and sexual lines. 
as well as economic power. So we have a lot of, uh, you know, issues, you know, discussions around how economies, how the economy shapes individuals and, you know, who gets access to resources and who does not. And that particularly affects sexual and gender minorities who are often low, uh, forced out of jobs or not given the same advantages into the job market and so forth. Another sort of thing of power, which is very much coming out of queer theory, and which queer theory very much contributed to, is the idea of discourse. Now, maybe some of you who have taken um, women's studies classes or sociology classes have heard of discourse before. But discourse refers to how we think and communicate about people, things, the social organization of society, and the relationships among and between all three. Discourse is, is basically how we think about people or an issue or anything like that. And we, in regards to a collective we, how like popular culture, popular society thinks about a certain issue, right? So, and it happens, you know, why do we all start thinking like, oh, these people are criminals or they are not criminals or whatever, right? Well, it's embedded in and it emerges out of different relations of power, the way that we think about someone or particularly a group of people. And so that involves, you know, the influences of the media, obviously politics, laws, medicine and education, all sort of contribute to popular understanding of a group of people or an, an issue. So we are going to be exploring discourse a lot more and I will go into way more detail about it uh, later on in the semester. Um, but you know one way to sort of think about it and we're going to be exploring it is the way that we th we sort of frame certain groups of people as being deviant or a threat or danger to society and that we need to protect our children from that. That uh, What we'll be exploring later on this semester is the, uh, is the bathroom bans against individuals. Uh, so these laws are put into place to ban people from going to the bathroom of their, that corresponds to their gender identity. Um, uh, people have called it also transgender bathroom ban and the, per the people who support the ban say that it's about protecting children from sexual predators and very much equating transgender individuals as sexual predators as well as saying that it opens up the door for sexual predators regardless of they're transgender or not. So that's just an example. We're going to be exploring this a lot more but this again is just sort of an overview of queer theory and, and the fact that a huge component about it is that it does explore power and how power is used to regulate individuals, particularly individuals who don't so fit so neatly into, you know, the main sort of dominant social groups. Lastly, I want to talk about queer as a verb. So to queer something or queering something. So you will probably come across books conferences and so forth saying, you know, queering, blah, blah, blah. Like I've attended many conferences around queering immigration, or I'm giving you examples right here around like queering consent, queering the classroom, even queering women and gender studies. And to queer something is, is very much about to take either text or literature or art or like institutions like immigration processes or education, you know, teaching and so forth. And first to sort of bring forward the experiences, voices, lives of individuals who are not heterosexual or, and or not cisgender and to bring them forward because far too often, you know, people who are not uh, in the dominant, who are not heterosexual, who are not uh, cisgender, um, are often left out and they can feel incredibly excluded, particularly um, education is a great example of that, where LGBTQ youth feel marginalized very much. So to queer something, to queer the classroom is about 
creating spaces uh, for not only queer students to feel safe, but to also bring forward new content and so forth to allow for a greater uh, visibility of LGBTQ lives and experiences. The other sort of way to queer something is to challenge dominant social norms, as what we were talking about before. So challenging, you know, if you're reading a text, and we're going to be looking at certain texts, uh, particularly uh, we're going to be looking at, and I'm sorry, Fifty Shades of, 50 Shades of Grey, and we're going to be querying that. We're going to be looking at how this book reinforces certain social norms and to challenge that. Um, we're also going to be looking at how norms are socially constructed, um, as well as sort of saying how identities are not stable or fixed. Queering is also very political. So queer activists um, have really sort of brought forward a radical politics based on both queer theory and activism um, that has sort of talked about ways that queer activism is not only about the sort of rights and, and protection for LGBTQ individuals, but it can also be about, you know, the prison industrial complex and how that affects not only LGBTQ individuals, but people who are poor, people who are not white, uh, militarism to universal health care. So queers also can be a politics, you know, to queer something, to sort of push it for so that, you know, if we're talking about LGBTQ rights, we, we should also be talking about immigration rights because many LGBTQ individuals are not only immigrants or having to deal with immigration systems, but the same sort of forces that cause migrants to be turned away or have their children taken away from them or languish in border um, detention centers for years not knowing their fate or be killed on the border are the same forces uh, institutional forces like state forces, uh, policing, and so forth that make LGBTQ individuals marginalized. So to queer something is both a critical uh, scholarship in the sense of like looking at literature, policies, and so forth. You can look at films and to sort of bring forward a queer perspective to it and also challenging social norms and so forth. And then to queer politics is about uh, expanding politics outside of just a single issue, but also expanding it in ways that, you know, challenges uh, norms in general. So what I have here um, is a picture. Uh, so on the left is a queer artist. And on the right is uh, an example of feminist art. And the reason why I'm ending this presentation on this is one to segue to the next uh, lecture, but to also sort of hopefully show and how I think of it as so much about queer theories, relationship and history of feminism as being one of mutual engagement. And so we will be exploring uh, in the next lecture on sort of queer theories, relationship and history uh, with feminism, as well as feminist embattlements around gender, particularly, and sex. So for the next lecture, we'll cover that. But for everything else that I've covered in this uh, little lecture, we're going to be exploring a lot of the things that I've touched upon in much more depth as the weeks go on. So if, if there were parts that were just a little bit unclear to you or you know, and so forth, that is okay. This is, again, it's just sort of to get your toes wet, and we're going to explore this in much more depth as the weeks go by.